So as the popular saying goes, context is everything. And without context, you don't know what subset of data your user is allowed to access in your database. You don't know which API endpoint is triggering that slow SQL query that you are seeing in your logs. And finally, when you find an error in your logs, you don't know what was the API you called at the beginning that eventually filed with this error. My name is Miroslav Bajtoš, and today I will tell you how you can work with context in your Node.js applications and how we can propagate it through your code. Before I begin, a quick introduction. I'm working for Protocol Labs, building a decentralized CDN. I joined recently. I came from lovely Czech Republic. Hello, all other people out there from Czech Republic as well. And in the past, you might know me from uh, my work done at Strong Group at IBM. I was maintaining Node Inspector in Node.js.10 days, long time ago. I was leading development of Loopback, which is an REST API and ORM framework for Node.js. And I had some uh, contributions to Node.js core as well. For example, async stack traces in the debugger. That was a fun task to work on. Okay, so context. Uh, what, is, what is it, context propagation? What does, what, does, what does it mean when I say context propagation? And I would like to explain this on a simple example. Let's say you are building a REST API server, which will get some data from your database, and then augment this data with some additional information by calling your backend API service, and then finally you return back your response. And if I was writing this in 2013 using Express, I would write a route, get products, and in the implementation I can call my database to get some data, and then I can call my backend services to get some more data, and then finally build the response. And even in a short code like this, there is a lot of context hidden and maybe visible under the hood. So, for example, there is a group of values which we have, which I, which I call application context. For example, correlation ID. This is a request header which you usually want to forward in your calls to backend microservices and you want to print it in your log lines so that when you aggregate log lines from all different parts of your system, you can group together lines for the single request you are troubleshooting. But then there is also user authentication, the user credentials, which you might want to forward to your backend services as well. And then user permissions, what, what data is the user allowed to access? You might want to apply this when querying your database. And this is kind of like high level, which you can see in your code. But there is also what I call implicit context. And these are things which are not so visible, but they are important as well. So for example, the fact that our query products function was called from list products, you can see it when you read the code, but at runtime it's not so clear because they are asynchronous uh, operations involved. And similarly, get ratings was called from the query products callback. And now if we step a little bit farther from this, there is also very interesting information that the get products handler triggered the SQL queries select all from products. And if you ever troubleshooted performance issues in production, you probably see a problem there. And it's useful to know that this query was called from your slash product handler because it makes it easier for you to find the place in your code which to fix. And then similarly, the same uh, API handler triggered an HTTP call to your backend microservice. And this is typically used by uh, performance monitoring tools which can visualize all of this for you if they have the contextual information needed. Now, if I was using Java or .NET or like Perl, CGI scripts, whatever, I would have much easier life because in these older frameworks there was thread per request model. So for each incoming request, we would start a new thread. In, the, in this thread, we will do our, our business logic and then uh, return back a response. And it's all nicely contained in a single thread. So I can use what's called thread local storage, which is a small area in memory dedicated for each thread. And whenever I write data there or read it from there, it will be always scoped to my single thread. So when I'm accepting an incoming request, I can extract the correlation ID, store it in my thread local storage, and then later on when I'm making the database query, I can, or maybe uh, uh, making a backend API call, I can get the correlation ID from my thread local storage and forward it to the backend microservice. Very easy. Unfortunately, this doesn't work in Node.js, because in Node.js we have a the concept of event loop, which is running in a single thread and handling all requests in this single thread. 
And the pieces and bits of your code which are executed for your request are interleaved. So for example, we start by handling our first request, then we do the database query, and while we are waiting for the database to respond, we can start processing the second incoming request. By the time the second handler started the database query, maybe the first database query is done, so we can continue with handling the first request, and so on. And this is great for performance. We can use a single thread to handle many incoming requests in, in parallel. But it doesn't work with thread local storage because there is single storage shared by all threads. So if I store my correlation ID for the second request in my thread local storage, by the time I want to pick it up, it has been overwritten by the second request handler. So that's not what we want. And this problem has been around for, for years. And there were many different attempts to solve it. So the very first one, which I would like to mention, is called domains. Domains were introduced, it was a built-in module in Node.js Core, and their goal was to understand all this asynchronous operation, how they are connected together, and the idea was to allow you to return back, back a nice error message when something went wrong in your application. By default, your application crashes, the TCP connection is terminated, there is no response. With domains, you can send back a nice HTTP error response. And, uh, it turns out the concepts introduced by domains are quite useful, also for context propagation. That's why I'd like to show it here. And the idea, oh, the idea is uh, simple. You create a domain, which is some sort of a scope, and then you run your request handling code inside this scope. And you also need to attach your event, event emitters to this scope so that the context propagation works, basically. And using the ideas in domains, somebody built continuation local storage, which was a userland module. It offered uh, API for storing and retrieving data. It's a little bit more complex. Let me quickly walk you through this example. First, we create a namespace, and this is for namespacing keys. So if you have different NPM modules and each of them wants to use continuation local storage, they have a safe way how to have unique keys. And then in your server code, you need to run your server handler inside a scope of a continuation local storage. So you run your code in a, you create a new scope, run your code as a callback. And again, we need to bind our requests and response to our request context so that everything works. And then finally, we call our handler request, our request handler. And with this setup in place, everywhere else in our code, we can very easily access our per request context, per request data using uh, the namespace object, and uh, there are APIs similar to map API, so you can set and get values. And this is all great, except it doesn't work always. And there are two situations which you can encounter. The first one is that context is lost, context is undefined, your application might crash because you are not finding data which you were expecting there. And surprise, this is actually the better situation because you know something went wrong. What is even worse, sometimes you will get incorrect context. So instead of get, seeing data for your request one which you are handling, you actually get data for your request two or the other way around. And this is tr very tricky to identify. You usually find it only when it's too late and it's production. So how can this happen? The code was very clear. We know uh, it should work, but it doesn't. So there are two kinds of problems, two kinds of situations which lead to these problems. The first one, the first group is connection pooling. So for example, if we are using uh, HTTP keep alive to reuse connections for multiple uh, HTTP requests, or if we are using database connection pooling, then you will probably lose context. And here is why. So when the first request comes, we start the database query, and the client library connecting to the database will have a a pool of connections, it will ask, hey pool, give me a connection. And there is no connection there, so we will open a new one and associate it with the context of the first request, right? Then we run the query, call the callback, and the callback is running in the context of our first request, all is good. And then the second request arrives, and it, the client asks the pool, hey, do you have any connection there? And the pool said, yes, here it is, here is your connection. But this connection is associated with the first request. So by the time our query is executed and our callback is called, the callback is called in the context of our first request. And that's why we will be seeing contextual data from the first request. The second group of problems is what we call task queues. 
it's a similar thing, and it's usually uh, related to user land promise implementations. The idea is that we want to schedule a task to be executed at some point later in the future, and then call our callback when it's done. And the thing is, we, exec we schedule the task with a specific context, maybe the context of request two, but by the time the task is executed by the task queue, it's running in a different context, maybe the context of request one, or maybe there is no context at all, and then that's why it breaks. So, what can we do? This doesn't work. One answer is uh, explicit context passing. If you are familiar with Go, this is what they do for context passing. Basically, just put your context into your first function argument, and it works. It just, it's just language, fun, fun, ah, sorry, just passing arguments. It's all nice, very easy to understand. So we build our context, and then when we call query products, we give it the context. When we call get ratings, we give it the context. Everything works well. It's very reliable. There is no magic. But it's also a lot of work, and uh, what's more important, we cannot propagate implicit context. So with explicit context propagation, we don't know which API endpoint is calling slow SQL queries, and uh, we don't get long stack traces. So it's still not what we would like to. And now the question is, what do we want, right? And uh, I would like to define the holy grail here, which is five things. First one, we want this API to be built in. Because if there were many NPM packages implementing this same functionality, then connection pools like the PG client library wouldn't know which of them to support. And maybe they decide it's all user land and we don't care. And uh, it should be supported by all Node.js core modules like the HTTP module, et cetera. And what's very important, it needs to be supported by native promises. And this used to be a big issue for many years. Uh, next, uh, we want API to restore context. So if I'm implementing a connection pool or maybe a task queue library like Bluebird, then we want to tell Node.js Core, hey, this is the way how you should restore the context for this callback. And finally, we want good performance. We don't want to slow down Node.js by 50% just because we added support for context propagation. And now that we know what we are looking for, we can start the search, the quest. And the very first iteration started in 2013. It was called Async Listener. And it was kind of like an exploration of the problem space, trying to find out what can be done, how the solution would look like, and it was abandoned before release. The second iteration was slightly more successful. It was called Async Wrap. It was built on top of internals of Async Listeners, and it, the initiative ended up with getting undocumented low-level API which was good, but still not good enough. So then the third iteration was finally successful, and that's what we have today. It's called Async Hooks, and it's, it's great. It's a built-in API, but it's still experimental. It's supported by all core modules. was very important. It's supported by native promises as well. There is API to restore context, which I will show you later, and it has very little performance overhead. Perfect. But it's not very easy to use, so uh, that's why we have other modules building on top of that. The first one was CLS hooked. CLS stands for continuation local storage, combined with async hooks. And it worked pretty well with one caveat that you had to initialize this module as the very, very first thing in your application. If you didn't, then things would get started before CLS hook was in, was able to hook into all the different places and you might still lose context. So it was almost there, but not yet. And so finally, uh, the project decided that this needs to be implemented in core, really, and that's how async local storage was created in 2020, and uh, it's perfect. It's a public API, it's uh, stable, it's easy to use, it's no JS core feature, and you can use it in, since February 2021 in an uh, uh, active LTS version. So, that's the history. And now I would like to sh show you how we can use these new APIs. Uh, first, let's start with async hooks. They are quite low level, and they are based on the design pattern of observers, maybe, or hooks. So, first, we want to create a hook that will observe different events happening in the async machinery of Node.js. And there are different things you can listen for. For example, you, you can define a callback that will be called when a new async resource or maybe an async operation is started, triggered. 
and you will get a sync ID, which is a numeric ID you can use to keep track of this operation later on, uh, a type, which is describing what kind of resource this is, and trigger a sync ID, which allows you to connect uh, children to their parents to reconstruct the tree of a sync flow. And very important thing to remember is you have to enable your hook. Before you enable the hook, nothing happens, which is good for performance, but it means your hook will not work yet. So you have to enable it, after which things change in Node.js core and your hook will be called. And uh, if I if you use this code and try to see what happens, we can write a simple TCP server, which is accepting, a, which is listening on a port. When we start listening, our init hook will be triggered, telling us that a TCP server wrap resource with ID five was created, and this was triggered by ID one. And once the connection is accepted, we will see that TCP wrap resource, ID seven was triggered by ID five. And here you can see the, the tree or like the connections between the different IDs. Seven is our incoming connection, five is the server which is listening, and one is like our application running up there. Okay, this is very low level. What is more important, I think uh, resource gives you uh, API to restore context manually. So for example, if we were building a message, a, a task queue, and it was all callback based, and we want to make sure this works with async local storage properly, all we need to do is call async resource.bind on our callback. And this will convert our callback function into a different callback, callback function that will restore the context for us and then we can continue with our implementation as it was before. Now, what's even better, if we are using promises, we will get all of this for free. So if I was trying to convert the same function into a promise style API, I would wrap my internal implementation with the usual new promise resolve reject wrapper, and that's all. The context will be restored for me. And that's all you need to remember about, uh, about async hooks. Next is async local storage, which is the thing you would like to use in your application if you are interested in context propagation. And uh, this is how you can use it. So first, you need to create an instance of async local storage. In other older solutions, there was a concept of namespaces and other things. Here, it's just the object instance. Each object instance is kind of its own namespace for, for data. And then in your server, you need to run your code inside a new uh, async local storage scope. It's similar to what we've seen before with domains and continuational local storage as well. And uh, what's important, then in your middleware and routes, you can access local storage uh, and it will be always the instance for your, for your request being handled. And what's important, you can choose what should be the store for your context. You can use a map, which will give you get and set uh, APIs, but you can use anything else whatever works for application. And this is still a lot of work, so probably you don't want to write it yourself. So I recommend you to look for plugins for your favorite ORM frameworks. If you are using Nest.js, I think you will get context propagation out of the box. If you are using Fastify, there is this neat plugin called Fastify Request Context. You initialize it by registering it with the app, and then you get the request context by requiring the module, and this is cool. And this is all good, and there are still issues. We are almost there, but not exactly. Uh, the first one is that there are tricky edge cases. So if you are writing this integration code yourself, you must be very careful to understand all the mechanics. So in this example, we are uh, creating an HTTP server. We run our handler inside a new local storage context. And then we decide, okay, we want to read the request body and wait until the body is fully consumed. And only after that, we continue with our logic. And the thing is, this will lose your context. So we are back where we started. And the reason why it's this way is that you create your local storage context after your request and response objects are created. If you look at line two, that's where we are getting request and response. On line three, we are running our code in the new context. So there is no way for the uh, async local storage runtime to know that you should be assigning these two or binding these two request and re response object to our, uh, to our context scope. So be aware, there are edge cases. And again, you should prob probably not write the integration with async local storage yourself. Use a plugin which already solved the issue for you. 
some user land modules are still catching up. So for example, the PG client, which is a very popular library for connecting to Postgres, if you are using callbacks, you will lose context because they didn't call async resource.bind. But remember, promises always fix context propagation issues for you. So if you are using the promise-based variant, all works. Great. And this is good. But then there are modules which we call abandoned where, things which haven't been updated in many years. For example, the Q module, there was the last release in 2017. It still has 14 million downloads a month, and I don't think it will be ever updated to support context propagation. Yeah, but if you are using Bluebird, which probably you shouldn't by now, but if you are using Bluebird, then Bluebird is calling a single resource at bind, so it will restore the context for you, that's good. And if you run into any issues with, with, with context propagation, a nice module was uh, added recently. It's called Async Break Finder, and it helps you to detect where exactly you are losing your context. So we can start by looking at your application as a whole, and then slowly uh, reduce the scope where the problem could be until you pinpoint the specific line of code where you can then use uh, async resource at bind or add a promise to fix the issue. So that's very useful. And that's it. I would like you to remember three takeaways from my talk. First one, I think local storage is finally here after so many years in making. It's stable, supported by Node.js LTS versions. If you are using promises and I think await, then you are fine. You don't need to worry about anything. And finally, please choose modern and actively maintain dependencies so that you don't end up with Q deep in your dependency tree, losing your context. That's all. Thank you for your attention. You can follow me on Twitter and find the slides on the web.